start streaming. All right, we're going to try this again. We're going to try to do another informal work a day live stream. I'm going to pick up on this same Doug's iPhone 10s Max and we're going to maybe make a video in the end. So, we're going to just do a live stream casually and see what we can make out of Doug's phone and see if we can get this to work. So let's see if it is working. That says that it's streaming and we'll see if anybody pops up in chat that can tell us if they can hear us. All right, let's see. It looks like it might be working. So my plan is to just keep fixing this phone and make some clips along the way and then edit it into a video at the end. All right, loud and clear. Okay, good. Then we're going to dive in. So let's put up the magic of the green screen, the green screen so that we can start continuing to fix Doug's phone here. So we will say goodbye to Christy. Hi, Christy. And we will put up some green screens. Green. All right. There we go. All right. So what we have, this is going to um, pick up from last week. So I started fixing this phone for about an hour last week. And we got up to a certain state took some clips along the way, intending to make a video at the end. And then I decided to give it a try again. Let's see if that is a format that the channel likes. Okay, so where are we right now with this phone? This is Doug's phone. And if you were not paying attention to the live stream last week, let's see if we can show you Doug's phone just to kind of catch everybody up, which means I have to figure out how to turn my hand cam on which is right there. Oh, hand cam is asleep. Let's see if we can wake it up and check in with you guys. All right, we're going to get rid of that guy. Okay. All right, here we go. Let's go. All right, hand cam. Let's hit OK on that. All right. Does that work? Let's find out. Yeah, there we go. Yep, so we can see Doug's phone here. This is papers, junk. Doug's phone, let's move that up. Nope. Yeah, oh, is that just the edge of that? Nope, hand cam. There we go. Aha, here it is. That's the phone. This is a donor board. Got run over and it had a lot of stuff wrong with it. So we've already put out some short circuits and last we checked, this thing still had a short circuit and the short circuit was apparently generating heat at a speaker amp chip. So let's kind of uh, check in with it. So I really don't remember where we left off. So let's take a look under the microscope and see if we can remember Oh yeah, it's coming back to me now. I haven't looked at this for a week. So yeah, there's a bunch of missing pads on there, that edge, missing pads here. And oh yeah, it's coming back to me now. We had a short on 1V8S2 that ended up being due to a capacitor right there. And we had um, a short on, I guess, the main power rail. Oh, yeah, it, had, it used to have a crack chip there. So we've already done a lot of work on this. So let's jump in and check on the main power rail in diode mode before we go much further on this. I feel like we did this already. I just don't remember it. All right, here is our battery. VCC is 0.4. That's normal and our VCC main is 0.367, so those are both normal. But if I recall, we had a current leak. So let's kind of refresh our minds on what was up with that, which means we need to get the DC power on screen working. So let me try to set that up. 
All right, let's see. I remember this one. Good. Uh, maybe you can fill me in because I don't remember it that well. It'll come back to me, though. All right, so DC power, we've got to turn that on. So my plan is to change up how I live stream on this channel and do kind of an informal live stream that's very open-ended, that has absolutely no plan. Usually if I'm doing a live stream in the past, I would try to pick cases that were probably going to be 45 minutes or less that were unusual or had a cool story, something like that. Um, but a lot of times, you know, those would not work out. Who knows? It's always open-ended when it's live. But YouTube takes the live streams and buries it under a tab called live, which means if you are new to the channel and you look around, it looks like there's not much content at all because I haven't made a lot of edited videos. So now I'm having to make edited videos and I'm gonna just give this a try to change it up. All right, so I've got my DC power, easy power program working. Now I just have to connect that here and see if it'll work. Aha, there it is. There's our on-screen four volts of DC power. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what does happen when we connect it to this phone. And let's see how you guys are all doing. Love this content, says Gail. Well, that is awesome. I mean, it kind of is, you know, it's nerve wracking. There's a lot of multitasking that goes on with live stream. I can't see anymore, you know, stuff's in the way. It's always kind of rough. So I thought, you know, Lewis did, uh, he's, he used to, he used to uh, live stream same as me and then he stopped doing that and he made a separate channel just for the live streams and then he turns his, all of those repairs into videos later. All right, so we do see a current leak. See that? Weatherman, it's right there. See, it's right there, 0 0.270, see that? So we've got a current leak but it's not the main power rail, it's not battery VCC. So we're not really sure what actual power rail is allowing electricity to go to ground and causing that 0.260 uh, amp leak. So we're going to see if we can get a clue where that might be by using the thermal camera. So let's kind of flip this around, and make it so that you guys can see the thermal camera. I switched out my blue mat for this black cutting board let's zoom in a little bit maybe there so maybe that'll have a bit of a cleaner look all right we're going to find my phone here's my phone and we're going to use the thermal camera to see if we can figure out what line might be short i think we need more of this content just a stream daily well yesterday's just a stream would have been quite different yesterday I got to watch a live stream of Jessa, specifically Jessa's colon. I went for my first colonoscopy, which was, you know, oh my God, I, I, I couldn't stand that prep. I had to drink the gross stuff at three o'clock in the morning. Isn't that insane? You drink it at six and then they're like, and then you need to drink it six hours before your appointment, the second bottle. Well, my appointment is at 9 a.m. Right, so then you need to drink it, drink the second bottle of stuff at 6 a.m. Are you out of your mind? You want, or not 6 a.m., 3 a.m. I had to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to drink the, the terrible, awful stuff, and it, was, it just all went downhill from there. So they ended up finding a giant polyp, which they had to cut out, and then they told me, so stay on clear liquids and you're not allowed to lift weights or go running. So that really sucks because I uh, train for a triathlon most days and now I can't do that. So I'm really bummed out. Not good news. All right, let's take a clip here. So I'm gonna hit start recording and we are gonna take a clip. All right, so Let's just remind ourselves what's going on here with DC power. I have heat. Look at that. I've got heat. And it looks like right now, 120 milliamp. Now up, look how it flashes up to 260 milliamps. So 
that seems to be pretty clear that it's coming from this chip. This chip is the speaker amp. Now remember that we already found a short that was due to a bad capacitor right there and we're missing pads along the bottom edge of the board. So right here where my finger is, this is right here. That's where that board really got smashed from the run over event. So it looks like there's actually more than one line that's short because right now we see 120 milliamps. Just a few minutes ago, we saw 260, 270 milliamps. And that's all seems to be coming from the area of this speaker amp chip. So let's look at that under the microscope and see if we can guess what's up with it. All right, so we're seeing heat under the thermal camera. It's just really lighting up this chip. I can't tell for sure if this chip has an actual physical crack in it, but the pattern of heat was right around here. So what is the purpose of this chip? It is a chip that controls loudspeaker. So it's a speaker amplifier, speaker amp chip. So I think we're safe from a data recovery standpoint to just go ahead and just take this chip off, even though we're not quite sure exactly whether it's you know a certain line under this chip or more than one or what let's kind of measure around these local caps just sort of for fun all right so we're detecting that this little guy here is on a line that may be short, but of course we'd have to compare it to known good. Let's look him up really quick. Let's see. Yeah, all right, so that guy is C4906. Let me see if I can show that to you on ZXW. There it is, ZXW. Let's zoom. Here's our speaker amp, and then we just detected that we had low resistance to ground on both sides of C4906, and what line is that? Bottom speaker VA. So that is a component here of this speaker amp chip. So I think that we're pretty safe to say, yeah, our current leak to ground is due to this line, maybe another one, and it's almost certainly due to damage of the speaker amp chip. All right, so now we've used our multimeter. Now we know what's going on, and we're going to go ahead and take that chip off. All right, so then I hit stop recording, and I'm going to stop that clip, and let's see. Ugh, gross. I have been drinking that. Time to bring the kids into training. Daily training stream. Mm, I don't know about this. Okay, so now what, let's talk about how we're gonna actually get this guy off. So this is a challenging chip to take off. Let's go ahead and start another clip. Take off DC power, start another clip. All right, so here's our guy that we need to take off. This is the little speaker amp. And as you can see, it's got heavy underfill all the way around it. And it's right next to the important CPU. So yeah, look, this is all where there was a big da big impact damage right here. All right, so how are we going to get this guy off? Let's say step one, put it in some type of a board holder. So we're going to have to get it to stay put. Now this might be too much of a challenge for video recording because now my entire microscope has to be up higher than it's going to want to go. Let's see, will I be able to do that? Will I be able to keep that roughly in focus? Kind of. All right, we'll give that a try. All right, now I'm gonna use some hair dryer heat to get rid of the underfill that's around there. So has anybody else had to have polyps taken out after colonoscopy? That's what I had to do yesterday which I highly recommend. Go get your screening colonoscopy. It is a 
the least fun way to spend your day, but man, they found a two centimeter adenoma, which is a precursor to cancer. And they sent it off for pathology, so we'll see whether or not that's a big deal. But the likely case is they found a precancerous lesion and they took it out. I am only 48, so the old guidelines, I wouldn't have even gone in yet. But when, this, when the gastroenterologist was taking that thing out, I heard him say, if this thing's not cancer already, it's well on its way. So I was really glad to have gotten that screening colonoscopy. Go schedule yours today if you are over 45. All right, let's take this off with step one. I'm gonna use my Mark's favorite sawtooth blade. If you don't have one of these, you can pick one up at ipadrehab.com, click supply, and go look for the saw blade. And I'm gonna use Mr. Saw Blade to just loosen up this underfill so that I can try and flick this guy, this chip off without causing too much extra damage along the way. All right, let's check in. All right. Literally bummed out. Ha ha ha. Yeah. I was definitely thinking that it was going to be a much easier time than it was. That stuff was so awful. I was drinking the prep called Suprep, which is supposed to be like the good one. I don't know about that. But by the end, you're, you're just trying to get this stuff down. And I would take like one big sip and then immediately throw up. Oh, it was PTSD to, to drink that stuff. The worst of the entire procedure, yay, they, they took out two polyps and one was really big. That's great to know that they caught those before they had a chance to turn into cancer, but it means I got to go back and get the joy of doing it all again. All right, let's see. Let's make sure that you guys can see this chip. There's a lot of like iPhone blood. Oh yeah, I was taking off stuff around the wrong dude. This is our guy. This is our guy. That's what I mean, live streaming is hard to keep everything straight. You can tell this one just automatically feels a lot like it's been pressed and pushed from the original damage. All right, let's cut off this. How many of you guys have ever taken off the wrong chip? I've done it. I can remember taking off a chip worse. I think I, there's even somewhere on here is a live stream where I, I took off like a iPhone 5 PMU, which is a pretty involved underfilled chip. And then I reballed it and put it back on. And then I was like, wow, I can't believe that this, this has the exact same problem. Nope, I just reballed the same dumb chip and put it back on there. Another time I remember putting on a, uh, a TriStar chip and then I looked at the phone after I was done. I took off the TriStar, I put on the new TriStar. And I was like, what? that's really weird. This new TriStar has the exact same number as the old one that I took off. That, and then only then did I realize, no, you just took off the chip, reballed it, put it right back on. All right, I think that we have carved that guy out enough to go ahead and flip it off. So my strategy for taking these guys off is gonna be to come in with a tool just like the, the tweezer, just kind of try to flick it right off. Let's hear what you guys would do. What's your strategy for taking off underfilled chips? All right, low melted and remove the wrong port before. Yeah, I can see you doing that. All right, 100% have taken off the wrong chip and also put the same bad part back onto a device. Yeah, it's just, you know, really tiny stuff and you're just working under a microscope and, you know, these two chips, they look, are they actually identical? Yeah, 338, yeah, they, they look like they're the same chip anyway. 
All right, that's our guy though. So we'll put the other one, nope. This guy, let's kind of turn it around a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna go like that and knock it off. So I'm gonna raise up my temperature somewhat and see if we can get this to come off nice and easy and pretty quick. All right, so let's get them off. That's going to be hard to show you guys. I think I'm going to have to spin them around. Can we still see it? There we go. We go and that's my strategy for working with guys like that okay so now we'll get knock off a little extra solder balls that are maybe gonna touch something and it looks like that chip was indeed cracked because it came off it should come off in one piece but if it was inherently already cracked like it is right there you can see that a portion of that chip is still present right there so we'll take that off with an iron and that is likely what the deal was now that's mighty close mighty close to the cpu so if the cpu itself is indeed cracked then that's going to be a data deal breaker but we don't know that yet it's just a what could be, not what it is, just like the ghost of Christmas future. All right, so we'll just clean that up a little bit so that nobody's touching the neighbors. There we go. All right, we might as well mow down all of those pads just to keep them nice and flat. There we go. So how many of you guys on stream are also working on devices at your station right now? What are you working on? Let's hear it. All right, we'll clean that up and we will check to see, do we still have a 200-ish milliamp leak? through the bottom speaker amp or not. Oh, got to touch that guy one more time. All right, let's see what we can learn from you guys. All right, I'm just watching, says Sunwave. All right, is that a resistor stuck in between the solder of the probe points on the edge? Uh, right there? Not really. A little piece of something. All right. Okay. Now, just for fun, first thing I'm going to do is check back to see whether or not the tiny little cap, is it still short? Remember how the tiny little cap we had measured with a multimeter and found that the line was short? Is it still short or not? So it was short earlier right here at this guy. Gotcha. Okay. Um, All right. Last is, Let me get a better place to measure. Nope, not short anymore. Okay, so there we go. That line was short, that bottom speaker amp line, and now it's not. All right, so we'll end that clip there. What's the answer, Sunday?
OK. All right, so now let's take this out and see whether or not we still have that same problem or something else to solve. So I'm interested in what Sunday's talking about up in the front. So I'm trying to listen in on that. OK. What did you find out? Tell us all here on live stream. Peter had a business tip, trip from France, and his friends own a drone company, and they needed to order that, but the shipping was $40, so he's just going to fly it home for them. Ah. Oh. I don't know. We're getting a mess next. All right. Not as, not as exciting as building bombs. But That's not as exciting at all. We had a... Uh, somebody went to iPadRehab.com, clicked supply, and ordered a single thing from the supply store this morning, which triggered a fraud alert because they used a credit card to pay for it four different times. So a credit card keep getting declined, try a different one, try a different one. So that triggers a fraud warning. And then I noticed that the address was to a hotel in Boston. And I was just wondering, what the heck does somebody at a hotel in Boston need one of these, the DC Power Supply Squid? So Sunday called him up and asked him. Answer, uh, he's just picking it up for a friend back at home in overseas, because overseas shipping is crazy expensive. We don't have any way to make that cheaper. So it, could, it might be 80, 100 bucks to ship the tiny little thing overseas. That's what we're being quoted. So. Uh, it really doesn't make sense to do those international orders. All right, let's see. So less, less of a fun story than it seemed like it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like when I go to a hotel, you know, we're doing micro soldering up in the hotel room for some kind of a cool application. But no, they're not micro soldering in the hotel at all. All right, now let's click back on to DC Power and make another clip. All right, so here we are. This is clipped in, and now I'm going to connect it. I'm going to complete the circuit here at the DC power and inject four volts. And survey says, look at that. Our leak is gone. Ding, ding, ding. 260 milliamps is now back to zero. And that's the normal state when we can pressurize all those power lines and the device is not actually trying to turn on so it shouldn't be consuming any power and it's not so problem solved so now we have solved two different problems on this we've fixed our cracked tigris chip or yangtze chip replaced that and now we found that there was indeed a short circuit within the speaker amp and we've removed that so now let's give it a chance to see what happens when we ask it to actually boot up? Will it attempt to boot? Now I'm going to check to see if this is an Intel or a Qualcomm uh, iPhone because that might change what we expect here. All right, it says Intel. All right, let's give it a chance. So we're going to now prompt to boot. So I'm going to prompt it to boot under the microscope and I feel like the let's go ahead and look under the microscope together I feel like the prompt to boot power button pin is somewhere up here in the 10s max is it let's see all right So what I'm seeing is a short little flicker, which is definitely not good. Man, this phone's really been run over. I don't know about this phone. OK, and I don't see that translating up for you guys to see it. So what I'm going to do is stop that clip. All right, I am going to go on a hunt for a charge port for 10s max which phone is this this is iphone 10s max if i have a charge port then i might be able to get it to continually prompt to boot through the charge port so that you can see what it's doing on dc power so let's see if i can do that all right uh let's see uh mm, let's see um 10s max charge port please have a charge port in here 
I've got a screen, I've got a battery, and no charge port. Mm, that might be a little bit harder to find because I had all three boxes with me yesterday at home. Ah, oh, 10S Max charge port. Anybody know where one is? You know what we can do? We can use this one right here. Let's use... Yeah, what are you talking about? I'm talking to myself and a couple couple, couple thousand people, a couple thousand of my friends. All right, let's try this. This will be a good charge port. All right, here we go. Lost the spares. Well, our known goods keep in a bucket, but there was one 10S Max that I was working on at home, so I think I took home like just to make sure I had one at home, I took home three boxes of 10S Max parts, leaving only one, and this one doesn't have a charge board in it. Whoops. Phone don't look happy. No, no, it does not. All right, so let's see if we can get this DC power working for you guys. All right, so let me check. Does it actually, what happens if I do this? Can you guys see? Yeah, all right, so that's going to work. All right, got it plugged in, and let's make another clip. All right, let's check it out. What happens on DC power when we prompt it to boot via the charge port of its own original, majorly dilapidated phone? But surely this charge port is going to work great. All right, prompt to boot, and look at that. So now we can see, is it booting normally? No, it's not. No, it's not. So it has got another leak somewhere. So we're seeing this kind of like fits and starts, like high current stop, high current stop, high current stop. What does that mean? That means that we're somehow uh, coming up against the, um, probably the PMU's over voltage protection that some of these devices have. Huh? A 10S max charge port? What are you talking about? Huh? Do you want a max? No, I'm just going to use that. No. This one's perfectly great. Look at it. Oh, it looks fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. I got it. Uh, I got it. It's fine. All right. Let's see. All right. So let's go ahead and go back to the old yield thermal camera and see if we can see anything going on that it can give us another hint. Where else? I think this phone has just has been crushed inside these chips on all sorts of places. Let's see. All right, Christine, NBC lady, answered. Okay. So let's see what we can find with the thermal camera. Wake up thermal camera. Let's try to make it so everybody can see. We'll see what kind of fun notifications I happen to get. Oh. All right, here we go. Wake up thermal camera. What is the brand of your hot air station? Mine is JBC. Look at that. We see yet another hot spot right in that exact same area. Can you guys see that? This phone got just clobbered in this one spot. Right, let's try to make it so that you can see. See that? All right, let's try to make it so that this can show you all right there's a very cl crisp very clear hot spot and it is perfectly clear for me to see but going from camera to phone display to the hand camera is a little bit tough let's try to zoom out yeah it's really clear for me right there right there and that is going to correspond to right here okay more of the same let's get out the multimeter let's get out the ipad rehab short killer and see if we can improve things this one's a long one all right let's check it out oh it's sam Hey Sam, what's up? K 
Can you stay what? Uh, what time do you want to get picked up? Um, I can do three. You want to come to the shop at three? All right, bye. Okay, now we have a deadline. That's good. All right, so now we're going to get out the multimeter and see what's actually there. Hi, Sam. Yes, Sam is uh, going to stay after school to get some extra points. What a good kid, huh? All right, let's check it out and see. Is this one remaining sad little capacitor short? All right, let's see. Uh, I like the Atten better than the JBC. Let's see. Oh, I've never used an Atten. I I don't see why people like those. I know Lewis likes them because he didn't want to supply the quicks because he couldn't get them, and that he didn't have a good margin. But I always like the quicks. I think the quicks are great, so we never we never try to do anything else. All right. The JBC or Quick. I mean, they're all fine. Let's see how to turn off the hand cam. There we go. Found it. All right. I think that, like, somebody sent us a message the other day that was like, what about all these different fluxes? I don't really think it matters, you know. I could, I'll, if I just ask myself, would I get up and go across the room you know, to, oops, you guys can't see that. Would I get up and cross the room to use a different hot air station? No. Would I get up across the room to find a, you know, special flux? No. You know, I don't think it's that big of a deal. All right, so now let's do another. All right, so now we're going to check to see what does the yield multimeter say about our hot spot cap here, and it says... Zero, zero, full short to ground. So let's check what line is that on ZXW. Here's ZXW. I don't know what line that is. Let's go find it. It's right here. So we've already removed. This guy was already short. This thing was short right here. I really have concerns about the edge of the CPU, but maybe it's okay. Now we've got a full short here on this one, PP1V1S2. So we already had a short on PP1V8S2. We've already had a short on bottom speaker VA. All of this going around in this corner. Plus we had a full on crack on that guy. Not looking good, but we're gonna go ahead and knock off PP1V1S2 capacitor with my favorite tool, the iPad Rehab Short Killer. Here it is, the iPad Rehab Short Killer. Get yours today. All right, so let's knock off this guy. And we're gonna eject this last thing. Now, we have a problem here because this is the EEPROM, must work. This is the CPU, must work. So you can get all the damage you want, but it cannot kill that guy or that guy if we wanna be able to recover data. So it's starting to get, starting to get unlikely for this guy. It's starting to get a little risky up in here. All right, so we just have to, same reason. I don't want to dare to touch that chip. All right. Back to the multimeter. Is that short gone? Let's find out. Multimeter, diode mode, red probe on ground. One side. Uh-oh. Let's see. That's not good. The line is still short. That's not good. All right, so now that line is short. No need to go uh, get out the DC power. Let's look at ZXW to say, well, where else could it be short, pal? What are the other things? All right, so the stream is getting risque. Uh-oh, it's Betsy. Hey, Betsy. Uh, I think you should ride the bus. I'm going to be, uh, unless you have something to do until 3. Do you have something to do until 3? I'm picking up Sam at 3. Do you want me to call Dad real quick? No. Yeah, ride the bus, okay? 
Okay, sorry. Man, those kids hate riding that bus. Sorry, Betsy. Betsy's got to ride the bus because Doug's phone has too many shorts in it. Hi, Betsy. All right. So now let's go see on ZXW what are the possibilities. So let's go check that out. All right. So not looking good. A lot of possibilities to be short here in the CPU. We've got some caps all around. So maybe. But man, that's not good. All right. Uh, so the best thing to do is probably solder a wire because we could readily have a short on this line out here right next to our other crack trip. Um, but before I do that, I think I'm going to just say let's knock off this neighbor just because so much of the damage was just like right here in this area. Let's go ahead and knock off this neighbor cap and then we'll have to solder a wire and go on a hunt for heat. So let's do it. All right. It is, mm, this is not good. This guy right here. This one is a little bit harder to dig out. There's just tons of underfill, and I don't want to bother anybody in the neighbors. Sorry, neighbors. There we go. Oh, another thing that you guys couldn't see. Sorry. All right. Let's Still short, so it wasn't that guy. So now we have no choice but to solder a wire. I wonder if it's going to be something like, oh, yeah, from digging around there. That's what it was. All right, we're going to hit stop recording and just keep sticking with our live stream. All right, looks like it gets deeper and deeper. How did the car building thing go? Apparently, it doesn't drive Betsy home. They built a car, and it is awesome. The prototype is so great. These girls are doing Odyssey of the Mind, and they have uh designed and built prototype one that did successfully carry all six of these girls across the kitchen so they have a propulsion system they have this cool whole design they've made some really cool technical features that they can't talk about because their competition is coming up march 4th for regional competition so wish them luck for the hfl problem one division two odyssey of the mind team uh, all girls engineering building a vehicle that has to do some cool stuff. All right, let's look for a wire that we can solder to. Thought I had one. Didn't I have one the last time I did this stream? Yes. Oh my God, it's still here. I found the same wire. I used a wire the last time and it is still there. Sweet. Keeping things in frame is always a challenge. Yes, it is. Because what I can see is much bigger than what the camera can see. So that's a bit of a drag. All right, we are going to solder a wire to this spot right here. All right, we're going to do that. Okay, so now I'm going to, oh no, I'm going to have to do the same thing I remember struggling with last time, which is to turn my DC power down to one volt. That's not good. All right, I'm going to figure out how to do this then. Fine, let's do... Fine. Let's turn it off and see if I can move it, move it, move it. Let's go here. Yeah, there we go. All right. That was so much easier than last time. Okay. So oh, now I put this wire on here. What is the right tool for the job? I don't think it's this big iron mini hat tweezers. Are you working today? Let's just see. Oh, you got to get a better spot for it. 
You know what? I think I'm going to avoid that spot. It's just too close to the all important EEPROM. I'm going to pick a different spot. And there's going to be some nice and easy spot. So let's go. Oh, yeah. Let's go maybe on the top side. Hmm. What do you guys think? Hey, chat, where's a good spot? Probably the top of this capacitor out here. Yeah, that's nice and in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Can you guys see that? So we're going to go by Tigris chip, and we're going to get the headlights of the car in front of Tigris. All right, let's give that a try. Did you go this year for Expo Repair in Vegas? Uh, Expo in Vegas? I don't think I went to Vegas. I do know the one that you're talking about, and that was one that I thought about going to. I think I had told Ryan that I would take him to Vegas if he came back and worked this summer, which he did do, but then he had to do running or something or didn't want to go to Vegas, so I didn't go. Uh, this year, we're definitely going to go to um, the forensics conference that we like to go to. Let me get rid of ZXW. All right, let me get rid of DC Power. And, you know, I, I did like the Gadget Repair Expo that we went to in Texas, but I think they're trying to do that a little bit too much. They're trying to, I think, kind of turn that into, you know, more than once a year. And then people just don't know, like, when to go. So if they said, we're doing it once a year, great. Then I, I, think, I think they did a great job with that conference. But I don't think that the repair industry... You know, it's going to be really hard for them to keep moving it around and making it in different places at different times because people want to go to the flagship one where everybody else is going to be there. And if you divide it up too much, I think that's hard to predict. So we would definitely be up for another Gadget Repair Expo in October, which would be, you know, one year. What did you guys think? Did you go to the Gadget Repair Expo or did you go to the Wireless Repair Expo in Las Vegas? What did you guys do for conferences? And what do you think? Would you go to a conference? Where would it have to be for you guys to want to go to it? Oh, not yet. No, we're waiting right. the answer from Tim that we All right, so I have soldered a wire over here at a different spot. And I chose this spot just because I needed to be away from the EEPROM. I just don't want to solder wires around there. It's just, eh, that guy's too important. So I'm going to solder a wire over here, and this line is, I already forgot, I think it was PP1V1S2. Let's check. PP1V1S2 it is. So now we're going to um, get out the thermal camera and see if we can find some heat on 1V1S2. And we're going to keep putting out the shorts, chasing them one after another until we get to a dead end, something that we need for data recovery that's dead, or we get this phone working. So let me... Or I have to go pick up kits. So we'll see. <laughs> What's it going to be? All right, let's get the thermal camera out. All right, so that's a, yet another clip. This is one where I can already tell, like, the idea of editing all of this into one video is already just, like, no thanks. <laughs> like, I don't even remember half of this first repair. And it's just kind of long. I don't know. What would you guys do? How, how can I edit this, all of these clips into an actual video that makes sense? Your videos are outstanding. I just recently found you on YouTube. Glad I did. Thanks for all your great information. Okay. Well, thanks for watching. Okay. Now, how do I make a great big long convoluted set of clips like this? How do I actually turn it into a video? I don't know. That's never been my strength. All right, so we've got this working. Poor phones inside is all Wi-Fi now. All right. Vegas, Florida, Southern California prefer, prefer warm spots. You know, I've been surprised that this year we were able to fill our January class. Actually, has nine people in it. February class has, I think, two only two spots left. So it used to be hard to get people to come out here for training in the winter somewhat. But that seems to have gone away as well. Okay, so you guys can see this. Let me get my glasses on so that I can see. And 
Let's see. Oh, we've only got like a little tiny 20. We've only got a little leak. Oh, you guys can't even see our little leak. Where is it? DC power. With one volt injected, it's only 20 milliamps. And nothing is getting hot at 20 milliamps. That's 20 milliamps. That's going to be hard to find. Let's check on the top side of the board. So 20 milliamps. What say you? All right, we're going to have to give it a little bit more juice. So let's turn this up. Nope, not that much. All right, now i got to figure out how to use this thing again. There we go. All right, does that help? Nope. All right, flip it. Mm, 40, 40 milliamps. Let me try to hold it still. I'm going to bring it over here a little bit so that I can see it. So what I'm doing is just sort of tap, tap, tapping to see if I can see any sign of heat, which is going to be pretty hard to see. I think I'm going to do, I'm going to stop wiggling the board by, oh, my wire came off. No. All right. My wire came off. So let's go ahead and see if, can we see heat? just with injecting through the battery. So we'll go back to, all right, I figured this out. Now I can get my, my numbers to change. So great. All right, let's try this. All right, let's go back to prompting to boot with the, the old cracked up dude. I kind of like this black cutting board thing because I think it'll be easier for me to dump it off and clean all the glass off. All right, now we're going to prompt it to boot and look, look for heat like this. No! Bad. Stop that, you bad, bad thing. I had to get an IV yesterday. So now I got a hole in my hand. Has anybody ever had a good IV that actually worked? All right. Okay, let's look at what's going on here with DC power. Here's our DC power. I'm going to disconnect it and do it again. Ready, DC power, what's happening? All right, prompt to boot. So we're not seeing this anything. We're not seeing the 40 milliamp or the 300 or whatever. In fact, what's it doing right now, guys? What does that look like to you? To me, it looks like just from moving that wire around or just injecting a couple of volts into that line that whatever its problem was, maybe was positional or something to do with the actual board, I think that maybe our 1B1S2 is not short anymore because that phone looks like it's booting. So let's uh, take a clip on that. All right, so we're plugging it into DC power, and it looks like something's up. Something is very unexpected. So I, my wire came off, so we're trying to hunt for this 1V1S2 short. So let's just look for it by plugging it in straight at the battery connector, prompting to boot with DC power. And now let's see, do we see that hang on current? And the answer is no. 
I don't know, it's behaving very erratically and very weird. But what that looks like to me is that that phone may be actually trying to boot. And it may be getting into trouble because it looks like it's going a little higher than normal, but maybe not. Right now, what happened to our 1v1 S2 short? I don't know. Maybe it was positional and just kind of manipulating the board and moving it around, soldering that wire and taking it off, or injecting the 1.2 volts somehow cleared that short. I don't know. But right now, this phone looks like it might be booting. Let's find out if it is. Let's put a screen on it. So I'm going to go ahead and disconnect DC power and disconnect from USB. And let's go ahead and dig up a screen. All right. It's trying to boot up. Yeah, it sure does. All right. Uh, your IR PC210 is a great cheap thermal camera. Well, we've done a lot of thermal cameras side by side. A lot of students looked at them, and the Seat Compact Pro was the unanimous winner. So that's the one we sell. That's the one that we use. But both the Compact and the or the Compact Pro and the regular are both pretty good. All right. So now, now we're worried that there is some kind of like positional effect. So I don't want to like press too hard on this phone. Right, because I, right now, I think that there's something up with like pressing the CPU or a chip or something that you got a chip that might have that 1v1 S2 short within it. Because we know that a capacitor can't just heal itself. All right, so we've just put on a display just so that we can see is it trying to make an Apple logo? Now we still would need to continue working on this device to get it to have touch, even if it does boot up. But putting on the screen will show us. Is it actually trying to boot? And can it make an Apple logo? Can it, can it boot up or what? So let's plug back in. I'm going to connect this here. Plugging back in our DC power. No current leak. That's still good. And now I'm going to plug in USB through the charge port and prompt it to boot. Let's see what does it do. Prompt, prompt, prompt to boot. And hey, it is trying to boot. It's making an Apple logo. We were reading that DC power correctly. Now, does it actually start booting and then hit a hot spot and drop off? Or does it actually boot all the way up to the lock screen? Hopefully, it'll boot up to the lock screen because I think that we already know from the beginning that we are not going to have touch on this phone, even if we connect to touch. Hey, there's the lock screen. That's always good to see. Look at that. So cute. And of course, it doesn't have touch because right now the touch connector isn't even plugged in because touch is down here on this other board. So it's not going to have touch unless we do one more operation. So let's jump in. We can tell right now from the beginning that we are missing a pad that's required for touch. So, so far we were able to get this board to boot and let's see what's up with touch. All right. So we're going to hit stop and take a rest. All right, let's see. Hoping for a successful repair. Me too. Is device repair still a good profession to get into despite all the measures manufacturers take to keep average folks from getting access to parts? Um, device repair is really broad. So for um, devices, sure, absolutely. There's a lot of devices and device problems that we see all the time that are totally repairable. For example, uh, everybody's game system has an HDMI port, a charge port, you know, things like that. It's easy to get those parts and pieces, and that's never been a problem. What's a problem isn't access to parts. In my experience, it's, it's, uh, the problem is when you can't take two broken devices and make one good because of manufacturers tying parts together. Now, I think that's a big, a big problem. Uh, my whole focus on right to repair is just about not tying parts, specific serial numbers of a part to a specific CPU. Can't do that. And I'm going to guess that because the FTC has a long history of not allowing um, the tying provision to a warranty of a specific part or service, it's really natural for the FTC to also say, hey, you can't tie device function to a specific part. And so I, I can easily see the FTC just saying, 
you're not allowed to do that anymore. Which means that, at least for iPhone repair, all of the things where, hey, you can't fix Face ID because the encrypted flood illuminator, and you can't replace it. I think that, that is, there's likely to be federal pushback against that. And I think that's likely. Um, and when that happens, that, may, that sort of opens up repair um, at least somewhat. So right now, the problems for mobile devices, so cell phones, um, is that it's tough, is, is this aftermarket part lockdown idea. So in order to foster competition for repair, we need to have aftermarket parts. They have to work in the device, right? So we can't have that parts tying that forces us into branded parts and service. So I think once we break that parts tying rule, you know, to say you're not allowed to do it anymore, then I think that we'll see aftermarket parts, the market for that, there, there will be, you know, innovation and we'll see competition that will then make it less expensive to get these parts that right now are just very expensive because it's very challenging. There's just not enough supply. So who knows what will happen. It's really exciting and in my experience, if it's challenging to fix this particular device, then it's still easy to fix this other one. And so, you know, if you have sort of a broad outlook. And I think on our channel, we'll start seeing, showing you more of like how we're looking into, hey, let's fix this other device, this other weird thing. There's a lot of stuff that's out there to fix that people haven't really thought about. But stuff like YouTube and sharing information is fantastic. All right, um, now I'm gonna have to pick up Sam soon, so I need to get touch working on this, because if we can get touch working, then it'll be a completed repair, and then we can take all of these pieces together and see if there's any magical way to shove them all into one video, which I don't know, man, this is a big one. This is, that would be, that would take forever. I don't know, I'm kind, part of me, sadly, sorry, Doug, I mean, you ran over your phone. This is bad. But part of me kind of thinks, I don't know, man, if it doesn't work, then I never have to try to make this video. We'll see. No, I want Doug's phone to work. I can't, I can't go that far. Okay. Um, what's the problem right now? The problem right now is that we have no touch, and here's why. So let's go back to the board, and I'm going to make another clip. So the problem that we have to solve right now is no touch and without even testing it, I know it has no touch and here's why I'll show you. Let's jump back under the microscope. So we're going to jump back under the microscope, taking a look and right here in the worst of the damage where we've already lost a bunch of capacitors and chip, we can see that we are missing of these little silver pads, some of them, that connect the top board to the bottom board. And unfortunately for 10s Max, the touch screen actually plugs into the bottom board. So the touch screen plugs in right here. Let me make sure that we all understand the problem that we're trying to fix. So just a quick review. The touch screen plugs in to this spot right here. So touch, this is the touch connector, plugs into the bottom board. Where all the data is, is here on the top board. Well, we've already fixed this top board enough. It already will boot up, but we can't plug in the guy's passcode and extract the data because we need touch. So the screen plugs into the top board. Touch connector plugs into the bottom board. So what's the problem here? Well, it's the top board. The CPU is not going to be able to accept the passcode and really understand what the passcode even is without touch. So this top board is going to have to talk to the bottom board over here at the connector into the screen in order to receive that touch input. So how does it actually do that? And the answer is, well, there's little connections between the top board and this bottom board that go over to the touch connector. And one of them is right here. Let's zoom in. One of them is right here in the area that we're trying to work on. All right, so let's find that spot again. Here we go. I'll do it this way. So in this area where there's the worst of the damage, we can see that we have a bunch of these missing pads. So we are missing one, two, three, four pads down here. And if we look around the whole rest of the phone, 
we are also missing kind of a slew of them over here on this side. So some of these we don't care about. We don't have to fix at all. At least I hope not. And I think that's the case for this pile over here. I don't think these ones are related to touch at all. And here's why. Let's jump on to ZXW and let's actually look up and see where these are. So the, let me make this word match. So let's kind of rotate. All right, so we'll make it match. All right, so you can see here that we're missing number one, two, three, four, five. And then as we continue all the way up, we can see what we're missing and compare that over to ZXW. So on ZXW, there it is. Let's unclick that. Okay, ZXW, if we zoom in and we can do the same thing, we can count one, two, three, four, five. And one, two, three, four, five is ground. Well, there's plenty of ground, so that one ground connection doesn't need to be there. And if we look up here in this section where we're also missing some of these pads and say, who are they? This one is UART AP to BT RTSL. What does that mean? I don't know. AP means CPU and BT, let's take a guess. Let's guess that it means Bluetooth. So this is probably connection between the CPU on the top board and the Wi-Fi Bluetooth chip on the bottom board. So with this connection being broken open, what's the consequence? No Bluetooth. I don't really care about Bluetooth. Doug doesn't care about Bluetooth because Doug just wants his pictures off of here. All right, same thing over here. This next one that is missing, you are AP to Bluetooth again. So we don't care about Bluetooth. We don't go care about this one. Bluetooth, don't care. Bluetooth, don't care. So this whole section we're going to put a great big don't care, not going to fix, not worried about all of these missing guys. But what about over here? So I'm going to spin this around and say, what about these guys? So in this section, we need to look up and kind of see what we're missing. So we're missing the top two and then on the bottom row, one, two, three, four, number five and number seven. So let's check out. ZXW, what say you about that bottom area? So let's check it out. And let's see, it's over here. So uh, yeah, it's over here. Top two are these guys. I2C0, generally important, SMC clock and I2 zero SMC data. Those are really important lines. They signal out from the CPU and it's one of the CPU's main communication lines. So let's click it and see, all right, well, where does it go? It goes from the top board. So from the CPU through this pad down to the bottom board. And then once it's within the bottom board, let's see, where does it go? It's going over here to this chip here, which says Ictera, 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 Ictera. Ictera, I think has to do with wireless charging. So I do care about I2C, but I don't really need to have wireless charging chip talking on that bail. I don't think I do anyway. So I'm going to ignore that one. All right. So I've got these two here, I2C clock, I2C data, they're together. They are important, but there it is not important for them to extend from the CPU to Ictera. If these lines were short to ground, then the whole phone wouldn't boot at all because they are important. So they can't be short and they can't be scrambled, but they don't have to go to every single one of the chips they talk to. They don't have to go to Ictera. It would be the same thing as why you can boot up a phone with no camera attached. Even though there's important CPU lines that go to the camera, they don't, they're not required for data recovery, so forget it. But what about these other ones here? All right, so remember on the bottom row, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, hall case to AOP South, hall effect sensor, I don't care. So that leaves this last one right here. One, two, three, four, five. Number five from the edge on the bottom row. And let me make sure that that's actually the one that we're talking about. One, two, three, four, five, right there. That is indeed broken, Mr. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five is indeed missing on our top board. And what does Mr. Number five actually do? So let's zoom in. Racer, racer to 
always own processor, interrupt when low. Racer to CPU. And racer to CPU, where does that go? Let's see if we can find it. Racer goes from the CPU, goes through our missing pad, it goes to the bottom board, through the interposer, and where does it go once it's on the bottom board? Let's look around. And it goes out to the very end where the touch connector is, and it comes up to the top board again, and it's going to land here on the top board. Right there, continuing on to, ding, 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 the touch connector. So racer is a line that connects our touch screen all the way through to the CPU. Do we all see that? That we plug the touch screen Let's make sure that we, we get that. That we plug the touch screen into this connector here. And one of these guys is a racer line. Racer is a chip on the screen. So the screen has to talk through the connector, down through this interposer board, all the way through to Mr. Number Five, which is then going to connect to our top board and connect onto our CPU. Except on our case, it's not gonna do that, because why? Because we are missing that pad. Pad number five is important. It's racer connected to the CPU. We cannot have touch screen function as long as that thing is missing. So we're gonna have to fix it. So let's go ahead and give that a shot iPad Rehab, are you a layer reballer or a pressure OEM spacer reflow? Oh, I'm a layer reballer. What are you? Pressure OEM spacer reflow. You mean these little spacer things? You use those? I think that, that uh, Chris is talking about this. Let's go ahead and make a clip so that we can chat. Stop. Are you talking about these guys? I think he's talking about these guys. Let's, let's ask him. Uh, how do we get our hand cam back? Are you talking about this unopened box of stuff that I have never actually bothered to open? So let's see. These are solder explosion proof, 24 karat gold plated foil. Now, I don't really know what these are for. These are something that we thought sounded cool and we wanted to try them. Brad, did you ever use these? Nope. Let's look at this under the microscope. I thought that, to me, I thought these were just going to be a bunch of these little spacers, and it looks like that is what they are. So let's check it out. Yeah, this thing full of glitter, really expensive 24 karat glitter. You Look, it says, do not eat. Okay. Try not to eat these things. I know you're hungry, especially if you had a colonoscopy, but don't eat these. So you, what do you use these things for, Chris? Tell us, because what I'm gonna do, whenever I need to put boards back together, I will do like we teach in class, which we've spent a lot of time teaching, teaching students how to really be good at putting these boards back together. And so we've kind of made it really systematic so that it always works, you know, and it has to, and it has to do with a lot of fine detail on that reballing that bottom layer. But once you do it, then it's like pretty robust, pretty foolproof. So what are you doing with the little spacers? Are, I thought they were something that maybe you would put on so that you could try to clamp it and do uh, thermal paste. So I don't know. Let's see what you have to say. Yep, that's them. Honestly, those spacers are good for pad repair also. Copper is cheaper. Okay, all I understood was 24 karat. <laughs> all right, let's see. Uh, depends on the situation. The iPhone 11's like the OEM spacers better. The 12 series, I'm reballing. Okay, spacers are good for pad repair. All right, well, um, I've never opened them until now. So right now, I mean, a lot of times we're, we're just like this guy's never going to get his layers reballed back together because he's got too much wrong with the board. So a lot of what we do is data recovery, which means I'm going to address this problem number five like this. I'm going to use 
Jess's smash ball method, which I'm surprised that more people don't know about. All right, make a clip. All right, so I'm going to get this together temporarily enough to have touch by using Jess's smash ball method. And I'm only going to fix uh, num Mr. Number 5 right here because maybe I'm wrong, but it, I'm going to guess on my first try here that this is the only one that I actually really need to fix in order to get data. All right, one, two, three, four, five. Step one, tin the nubs. So I've tinned the nubs. And then next, grab a tiny solder ball. All right, so by tiny solder ball, I mean one of these, a tiny pre-made solder ball. Where do you get these? iPad Rehab Supply Store. Get the size that's 0.3 for this purpose. Yeah, these ones here that I have are 0.2, so that's a little small. I may have to use two of them. All right, try not to get too many of them out. Where is my 0.3s? Did you steal them, Brad? Uh, I might have. You might have? Well. I'll see if I can make it work with this point too. Oh wait, here's some. What's this one? Oh wait, I got point three right here. All right, here I'll show you how big, how much bigger I found a point three. Oh, I see. Look at that, great. This is the size that I think is better, point three for this application. Let's make that clear. So you can go to iPadRehab.com supply store if you don't have these and grab pre-made solder balls and they come in different sizes and their traditional usage would be if you're reballing a chip and you wanted to just use pre-made solder balls but we don't do that we just use it for this um, this 0.2 size one is kind of a little bit too small so i'm going to delete it and i'm going to use my 0.3 which is like the exact right size so there we go 0.3 okay then i'm just going to heat this sucker up And I like this method because you can get a whole bunch of these done very quickly. Now this is not what I do for repair. If I'm reballing the layers together, I go ahead and use the pads, the solder lugs in order to get these back on. All right, something like that where I just kind of poke it until it you know, snaps on there like a lollipop onto its stick. And then smash ball, smash ball method. I'm going to use the back of my iPad rehab tweezers. Press, 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 press. And there you go. Look at that number, Mr. Number five. One, two, three, four, five. It looks and it's going to act just like a pad. And you can do a whole row of these. Quick, 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 smash, and then move on about your day. All right, so that's my smash ball method. And now let's see. Um, data is socket, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, so we haven't really messed around too much with, like, we just reball. Um, yeah, every all of the ones that we've done for repair, we've just reballed bottom layer and seems to go okay. So I'm curious to hear your experience with those little. Do you use? The, do you just put these on, and then what? Heat it up. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing with the little, what are you doing with these things? Putting them on every single one of the uh, pads or just the missing ones? Are you using it just to reball stuff that's not missing a pad? What are we talking about? Okay. Tin the pads, tin the spacer, and reflow in pace on every single, on every single one, and then you put the top board on? Sounds, sounds interesting. Sounds laborious compared to, to paste reballing, but maybe not. Um, I'll give it a try. Sounds fun. All right. So now I think that I'm ready to try and get Brad to get me an eye socket. That's going to be the hardest part of this. Let me hit stop on that clip. Okay. I need a 10S Max. This really sucks because I know for sure that, does that work? Yeah. Do you have a, a definitely for sure works? Does this guy work? Definitely for sure? Who's this guy? This guy? I don't know. Because he's a little bendy.
Is that 10S Max? Where'd that come from? Brad Just Stash. Just the secret stash. Just a secret stash. Okay. Oh, I see. There's three charge ports in this one. Okay. Hmm. Okay. All right. I don't know about. I don't know about these. They're a little bit bent, but we'll try them anyway. Uh, well, I'll just give it a try. All right. So let's let's give this a try here on our on our live stream, and if it seems like it's good, just for needed missing pads. Oh, I see. All right. Well, that would probably work. All right. Let's see about our eye socket. Let's. I liked what I liked about those little gold things were the phrasing, solder explosion proof. Explosion proof. Like, what do they mean? Like, what, what happens? All right. So we got two choices. So chat, help me make a decision. Which one of these should I attach to? I can attach to the iCloud lock or I can put the top board on its native board. I feel like we already looked at its native board and said that its native board, I don't know, let's look at it again. The native board is gonna have like the native N NFC chip and is kind of a, a better pick as long as it's not, mm, Like damage, damage. Oh, let's try the native board first. What the heck? All right, we're gonna just we're just gonna mess around on live stream. All right, in order to do my native board, I need to get rid of those ugly pads that are already on there. All right, baseband isn't needed for data. Does NFC affect data recovery? That is a great question, and the answer is yes. So we always used to use the iCloud lock board for data recovery because why bother with the bottom board, the native bottom board, like that's unnecessary. And then we started noticing weird things. So you would boot up and it would say swipe up to recover, which was weird, but it usually would. And then we started noticing that if you entered in the correct passcode, it would say, nope, wrong passcode when you had a foreign bottom board on here. Let me make sure you guys can see. I am under the microscope and I'm just cleaning off the little, the, the ripped up end from the native bottom board. So the native bottom board is best if it works because you're not gonna have any like NFC mismatch where it does weird things like tell you the correct passcode is wrong or any other weird stuff. It's not going to, I don't know, complain about stuff as much. So um, you can solve all of those problems with an update usually, but I don't like asking really beat up phones to update. I kind of consider update a bit of a last resort. So whenever a lobbyist starts yelling about exploding magtronomers, I think it's magnetrons, we can counter by stating that everybody knows there's 24 carat gold glitter for that explosion free. Yes, I did replace my magnetron in my microwave at home, which it's so funny. Like I actually did a repair the other day at home that I was like, this is, if you wanted to make an argument that this was dangerous, I would agree with you. I would say, yeah, this is dangerous. So what I was fixing was in my office at home, there's a propane stove, you know, so, okay, it's, uh, gas stoves are bad, noted. And the propane stove, the remote control wouldn't work. The switch to turn it on and off wouldn't work. So I can't turn it on. So I've already taken the whole thing apart and I've got my head inside this stove with a lighter and I'm trying to light the pilot light and, you know, that's already dangerous. I get the pilot light lit, but it won't turn on. So I go to, hey, Google, how do you fix a remote sensing remote? And it told me all your, I mean, it was so great. You know, some fireplace stores, like you gotta have a certain milliamp drop between A and B. 
and you can test if it's this or that, take this speaker out, eliminate variables, fixed it. You know, so I, Jessa, with no experience, fixed my propane stove appliance in my home. That is actually, there's an argument to be made of maybe that's dangerous, right? <laughs> Jessa, what are your thoughts on Samsung patent ordeal? Oh, I have no idea even what's going on. My thoughts are mostly about adenomas and polyps and colonoscopy since I was pretty much gone. Um, I would have to read all of that stuff, so I don't know. I, I have a bad habit of, of uh, not, not watching Lewis's channel, and I think he gets tips from everybody and makes these videos. I talked to him the other, I talked to him yesterday, I think, but we were just talking about FTC stuff, so I don't know. All right. Wonder if that correct passcode error is something that causes unopened boards to do the same after update. Well, see, that's the thing. Update cures that problem. So if I know for sure, passcode is one, two, three, four. Uh oh, you're gonna be in trouble. Hey, Sam. Hey, what's up? Oh, you have to walk down. I'm actually doing a live stream. I see that you're not a subscriber. <laughs> All right, bye. He said, oh, my bad. <laughs> All right. All right, we gotta stop the chit chat because I gotta I gotta figure out if this is gonna work or not. But update, Chris will solve those ones that passcode is one two three four and it's bonking on the um, the known good board. If you update, then it will accept that correct passcode. So that's sort of the cure for this. And in fact, that might be that might be what uh, what has to happen here. All right, so let's just give this a try. All right, so we'll make a clip in case this works so that we would have a complete video. All right, let's give this a try. We're going to put all these pieces together. So I've cleaned up this bottom board a little bit. This is the native bottom board. And I always like to try to boot off the native bottom board, and it'll either work or not. If it doesn't, because there's a problem, which may well be the case with this run over bottom board, then I can always use my iCloud lock. But there's some little tricks and incompatibilities that I'll have to solve in order to get that to work. So hopefully we can get Doug's phone here to boot up with touch. That might be a bit of a tall order, so we'll see. All right, so step one, I got to connect a connector. That's, a, that's, that's the hardest thing I ever do on my channel anymore. Connect connectors. Boom, got the connector connected. Let's move this. Let's plug this in. Man, Sam, Sam, it is three o'clock. How did that happen? How did it get to be three o'clock? All right, let's make sure that that's actually connected. Yeah. Now, the other thing I would always do, and I just went through this at home, is proof the part. So I like to keep an iCloud lock board around just to make sure that this thing doesn't have like a little bend in it so that it doesn't work. So I'm constantly proofing the known goods. And I'd like to do that for this one, but we're gonna just give it a shot and see if we get lucky. All right, so that's connected. We'll use one of the charge ports that has been delivered thanks to Brad. All right, so we'll put on an actual charge port rather than having to use the beat up one. All right, so this is our massively beat up phone for you guys that missed the beginning. This is day two of this repair. All right, and in case it doesn't boot up, let's go ahead and use DC power so that we can troubleshoot it. We could use a battery since we think that it now is able to boot, but remember it had that sort of wonky problem with the PP1V1S2 line. So maybe that short is back, we don't know. All right, answer that short or a short is back. I think it's a different short. Plugged in, short, and what does that tell us? Short, it tells us, nope, bottom board has more stuff to fix on it so we're going to say no native bottom board for doug 
And we are now going to try to boot Doug's top board on my bottom board. So we got to reverse. All right, no go on that. So we'll use a known good. Now, what kinds of little incompatibilities and inconsistency problems are we going to have? Well, we may end up having to update this phone in order to get it to, to accept this bottom board. So forensically, that's not a good idea. So if you are here from the law enforcement community or you're thinking about coming to the course or you just watched our recent podcast or listened to our Gray Shift podcast and you're wondering about this, Law enforcement, you're going to have to jump through some more hoops because we may end up having to update this board. So if you're in law enforcement, you may end up having to take the data containing chips that are for RF, the ones that are married to the top board, moving them to a good bottom board. Or just keep on working and keep fixing that bottom board. OK, so what do we have connected here? We have the touch screen is connected. The top, oh no, that might not, I don't know about that. Top board is connected to the bottom board in the eye socket. We've got our squid connected. And now do we have a short? No, we don't, so that's good. And now we're gonna see, does it boot? Let's boot it up. All right, prompt to boot down here with DC power. We can see right there, this phone is booting. And now we'll be able to show that by flipping this thing over. Here it is. So now it's just a question of whether or not this phone has touch. If it does have touch, that's gonna be a path to data. We're gonna end up having to update this top board on this bottom board so that it will marry it Swipe up. All right, so here's the money. Does touch work? No, of course not. All right, so touch doesn't work right now. And the most likely case in my experience is something to do with parts or this eye socket. So next stop, we are going to have to proof these parts and then get it to boot up with touch. And I'm probably not going to have time to do that today. So we'll see. I'm going to end this clip. And... I think what I can do is just, is there any other phone here? Didn't I just do one? Did I, I think I left it at home, the one that I just did, where I just proofed all these touch parts. Grr. Are you a secret stash yeah, it's not a secret. I mean, all the parts that are, you don't see here are at home. That's what happens. I mean, they kind of go home and come right back, but. Hmm. Is there any way to show that this, I don't think there's anything wrong with this. I think this is ready to recover. But I want to be able to show it so that we can make this damn video. Mm. Yeah, do you have a fresh new cable? All right. Let's look and see. That would be awesome because Sam is going to, when Sam gets here, can you like make him do something with a 3D printer? All right, I'm gonna, next thing I'm gonna do is sort of clean off my, my dude so that he works. All right, hello from Portugal. I wish I was there to do the course. I quit it when Apple added their logo to random flexes on devices to claim copyright infringement. Yeah. Oh, was it something to do with import? What I've been saying is that we need to focus right to repair on allowing aftermarket parts to work. I think that we would see more competition from China. Like, look at what they did with the, you know, the quality screens for the older phones. Like, those are all, like, pretty great, you know? Like, people like them. They work really well. And they're pretty affordable. So... Why would, why are we not doing that? And the answer is, well, we're not doing that because there's too much serial numbers and parts tying and stuff like that. Well, let's kind of force 
get rid of those roadblocks so that we can have innovation. Hey, Sam, is that you? Yeah. All right. I am, I think I'm just going to test this one more time. I think this phone is fixed, but I can't prove it right now. So that's going to stink if that's going to require another one. All right. Samsung is literally trying to fight exactly that. Well, then that's the fight that I want to take up. These are not brand new. Okay. All right. So let's find the least squirrely of these. All right. Let's see. They don't want quality aftermarket screens to compete against. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the problem. I think that uh, I think that for me, it kind of the example that I liked. Yeah, see, like, look at this flex. This is not good. This is what happens to these flexes. See how they just get like kind of chewed up just through use for a long time. So I'm going to say that one's probably not good. Uh, this one's also not my favorite. Not my favorite at all. Are those the only two? This thing, um, that'll be too hard. I mean, it will work, but it's, no, that one's been used way too many times. Nah. Um, you know what? The real thing to do, Brad, is for me to go get that screen for you from home and come back. All right, let me take off the one that was on here. Ah! Was this, oh yeah, geez, look at the one I was using. It has holes in it. Ha! Ah! Yeah. What do you think, Brad? Is this one good? Yeah. It's fine. All right. I'm going to say this is a reject. That's probably garbage. Will you fix it on stream? That's a great, great. <laughs> there is a Brad. Watch him fix this flex. All right. So the example that I was going to, that I was, that I liked was, the thermal printers, you know, your receipt printers, thermal printers. So everybody can imagine themselves making a competing thermal paper. Like, I don't know how I would do that, but if you were going to put me in some kind of a dungeon and said, listen, you're either going to die in this dungeon or you're going to have to come up with an idea on how to make a printer paper that turns, that, you know, prints by heat, I wouldn't die, you know, well, you could, you could survive that. So now there's this idea of those thermal printers, the receipt printers, requiring branded paper, right? So DRM on the paper. And it's pretty easy for everyone, every legislature, you know, like every person to say, yeah, that's not cool because that's not really a part. You know, that's just a consumable, it's like ink, you know, the paper. You know, a printer can't require you to use their paper because that really cuts down on competition. Like I want, we all want for there to be a lot of competition in the paper space, right? So everybody can understand that and that kind of makes a lot of sense. And so I think if we just kind of extend that to, well, how about your phone screen? Well, no, then you got safety and security. I don't really think that people are going to necessarily be able to remain convinced that there's a lot of safety and security actual bona fide risk that makes it worth them giving up their ability to choose whether or not they want to use some kind of aftermarket screen or not. All right, we're just going to try this one more time. So let's make another clip. All right, so now I've, I'm going to give this a try on my iCloud locked bottom board. And I might have to jump through some hoops. I might have to update it. But if we can get touch working, then we'll have a path to data here on Doug's massively, extremely run over phone. All right. So this is Doug's bottom board, which had a short on it. So we're just going to give it a try here. I've cleaned this up a little bit. You have to sometimes troubleshoot this. I had to change a flex and make sure everything is bonded. And now I've got to do the awful thing. This is almost as bad as my colonoscopy. Got to connect a connector right here on YouTube. Got it on there. All right. 
When I used to teach at RIT, there was, it's a, call it National Institute for, Technical Institute for the Deaf, and there was always accommodations, and we always had interpreters. And that was an accommodation for people that had the disability of being deaf. I would like to have, instead of an interpreter, I'd like to have a connector-er. -er -er. A connector -er -er? Come over here, do all these connectors because of my uh, visual disability due to being 48. What do you think, Brad? Is that a good idea? Do you think I could get a person that's just a connector kid I'll or something? <laughs> all right, now let's prompt it to boot. So we've got DC power connected. We've got our charge port, we've got our screen, and now, will it boot? Will it have touch? All right, so we're gonna look at our DC power, and it doesn't look like it's booting anymore. Great, more stuff to solve, why not? Why are you not booting? Yep, nothing on the screen. It is not booting, why are you not booting? Oh, now it looks like it's gonna start booting. Nope, it doesn't like something. Boo, hiss. Mm, that's going to be too big of a problem for me to solve while Sam's sitting here waiting. No, why are you not booting? All right, let me just try that again. Is it something I connected wrong? Let's look at this. Boo, hiss. That's a, not a fun, exciting conclusion. No, that's still working. I really feel like there's nothing wrong and that this is going to boot up just fine. I need a, current, a connector or two. Connector or, yeah. Connector or. Brad. Okay, here we go. Just like with cars, allow anybody to choose whomever they want to fit any type of aftermarket part. Okay. All right, let's see what DC Power says now. Prompt, prompt, prompt to boot. Is it going to boot or is it going to chill at 30 milliamps? And it's kind of doing the same exact thing, which is not good. That means it has decided it doesn't like me anymore. All right, let's back it up just a little bit and say, can you boot? on your own little buddy. Let's eliminate some variables. All right. This is a good ad for iPad Rehab. I don't know who else goes through all of this mess just to try to get your data out of this board when you totally trashed it. Prompt, prompt, prompt boot to boot. Can you boot? He says, nope, I'm chilling, I'm hanging, I'm the exact same way. Let's see, yep. So right now this board is chilling and hanging at 120 milliamps or not. Let's see, what's your deal? What do you not like? All right, so it has, it has lost its ability to boot, which really stinks. So that's going to be another, like, a lot of work to try to get it to boot again. What's your deal? You can't boot. Boo! -hoo -hoo. <laughs> All right. I think I'm out of time for today. So that's another live stream. So my, my goal with these, um, I'm going to hit stop on that. My goal with these live streams is to just kind of chill like we are just chilling at the shop while making clips that will maybe one day turn into videos or maybe not um, rather than try. I mean, I can't live stream just to make videos anymore because those videos are now buried on YouTube under the live tab so nobody can see them. So I have to make videos. And this is what it's like when I try to make a video. It's just way too long and it's way too laborious because these are open-ended. You go down all sorts of, you know, fun rabbit holes. Boot, mofo, boot. And it's really hard to like turn it into a cohesive story after the fact. I don't even rem remember it. All right, so uh, I don't think there's anything else I can do with this one today. I think we'll, I don't know, circle back to it, start another whole stream on this guy. I really thought that was really close to the end. Let me take a quick look and see. 
if there is anything jumping out at me as a reason why it would be like that. Because this one would be a real drag if it ended up after all this having to go ultimately to get CPU transfer. That would not make me happy. All right. Mm, I don't see any reason. I'm going to check to see if 1v1 S2 is, did that ever actually come back to normal or not? Let's check. 1v1 S2, how you doing? Mm, I don't know if that's normal or not. It's still, it's not zero, but it's pretty low. But that might be normal for that line. I'd have to look that up. It was zero, though. All right, let's... Can't you decide to just boot? All right, let's just make sure that we don't have anything to learn here. And then I'm going to drive Sam home, who's probably cranky. Yeah, it's 312. Yikes. All right. 120 milliamp. I am going to make sure it didn't just stick itself in DFU because that would also suck. On behalf of chat, apologies to Sam and Betsy for keeping you distracted, making you run late. Looking forward to part three. I don't know if I can keep this phone here for another week. It might have to go out and get a faster answer, but we'll see. Maybe I'll come back to it. All right. Can you boot, or are you a 120 milliamp phone? Let's find out. Uh, nope, it's a 30 milliamp phone. 30 milliamp phone. And when I disconnect USB, 120 milliamp phone. And do you connect to the computer? He says, no, I do not. All right, that's our result. We have a brain dead phone that sat here and became brain dead for no reason whatsoever just decided it felt like being brain dead right here on the desk and it's just chilling out and it can't get past 120 milliamps which means cpu output is not happening don't know why hopefully it's not because of any kind of fracture in that cpu all right that's it for today. I'm out of time. That's the end of this live stream. And maybe one day this whole job is going to get put together in some video that you will then see edited on the channel. We'll see. Check back.